Hello, everyone. Welcome to this session on supercharging your prospecting and pipeline building programs at your companies. And uh, this is such an important topic, especially now in 21 with our teams being remote, coming back to the offices and the way we prospect, the way we build relationships, the way we build pipeline, uh, the way we enable our teams to be great to master is, is completely changed, completely evolved. We're gonna show you some tips and tricks today. So a couple of things, there are some resources that uh, we are gonna be sharing with you along the way. If you go to my Twitter handle, uh, you can see some of those blogs there so that way you can already start getting a head start. And, uh, and for those of you, uh, and, and then those of you that have not read my book, my book also can, will be a great guide for you as you're trying to learn more and become a master at, uh, at enablement. And that's our goal, right? So let's talk about today. What are the goals for today? Number one, we wanna help you get your sellers to be better at prospecting. And uh, and that's kind of mission number one. How do we get your teams self-sourcing more pipelines? So we're gonna provide you with some tips and tricks and some, some lessons that we've learned and some proven plays that you can execute today with your teams. Number two, we wanna then help you visualize how you can scale prospecting and pipeline buildings with your teams. And that's gonna mean working with your frontline managers. That's gonna mean seeing a prospecting bootcamp system in action. We're gonna walk you through it. I'm gonna show you a system and we're gonna help you get started. Some of you are customers and we're grateful and, uh, and, and uh, you know, you've already got the system uh, and, and now it's a matter of implementing. And those of you that are not customers that are new to saleshood, you're gonna to wanna to kind of dig in and, uh, and really start taking advantage of this amazing program and our sales enablement platform. And I do have a special guest, John Selig. He's uh, uh, an amazing uh, special sales trainer in the world. And he's all about comedy for sales. And we're gonna meet him in a little bit. And when we talk about humanizing sales, when we talk about humanizing our prospecting and our writing and communicating, why not do it with comedy? And so John's gonna give us some tips on that. I've asked him to join. We spoke yesterday and thought you should join me. So uh, again, really excited and, uh, and hoping that everybody uh, will get a lot out of this. And just as a reminder, Saleshood, we are a purpose-built all-in-one sales enablement platform. And we're just so excited to have all of you here today. And, and our mission is to help elevate the sales profession, to help elevate sales uh, go to market and to help companies boost the productivity of their teams. And, and so one of the things we've noticed, one of the things we've noticed in the last three to six months is, uh, you know, prospecting continues to be a focus. Who doesn't want more leads? Who doesn't want more pipeline? But companies are struggling. Companies are struggling because uh, there is a lot of noise. You know, I do a lot of prospecting myself personally, and I get prospected to a lot. You know, I, I love, uh, I, 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 you know, I, I, uh, I respond to almost every email that I get because uh, I, 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 I like reading them and I like seeing where people are at. I also will respond to phone messages and to uh, when people call me, uh, if I'm not in a meeting, I will answer those, those cold calls. And I learned so much, you know, what am I learning? I'm learning that uh, even with the focus on personalization and relevance, and even with all this amazing automation that we have, messages are still not personalized. You know, there's still a lot of insert name in emails. You can see it, you can feel it, you know what those emails look like. You know, when I get called from someone and, and I say, yes, I'm Eli, you know, yes, how can I help you? They're spending 25, 30 seconds pitching versus actually trying to engage in a, in a human conversation. Uh, I think that we're still not being creative enough in our outreach. Uh, I think we're not leveraging, uh, uh, you know, enough uh, creativity in what we say, how we say it, when we say it. Uh, I think I, I'm also seeing uh, sales teams and sales organizations giving up too early, right? You know, you know what they say, it's eight to 10 touches, right? And I'm gonna walk you through some best practices there. Um, too pitchy, I, I, I will say this, I'm not sure why we're just not picking up the phone more, especially now in a time when people are remote, people want that human connection. And, and it, just because I pick up the phone doesn't mean every executive will pick up the phone, but I think it's important that, uh, you know, as an executive, when an executive gets a, a, a voice message and if it's professional and it's clear and it's concise, and then they get a follow on email and then a LinkedIn connection, and then they get a like or a comment on LinkedIn, and then they get another voice message that's professional, and then they get another email, guess what? The likelihood that I'll respond and say, this is interesting, or thank you very much, but this isn't something that we're interested in now, maybe later is super, super, super high. 
So these are some of the things that we're seeing in the industry that can be improved. And this is what drove us to want to host this session right now on prospecting and, you know, encourage you to add comments or ask questions, but uh, uh, just a little snapshot of what we're seeing and what I'm personally seeing when I'm doing my outreach and when I'm being prospected to as well. And again, my commitment to anyone listening to this, if you send me an email and it's a prospecting email, you know, you know, I respond and, uh, and I love them. And sometimes I respond with feedback. And, uh, and as well, if you call, I will do the best I can to pick up those, those cold calls because I learn every time someone calls me and, and, uh, and I want people to continue picking up the phone and I want people to continue to really be creative and personalized. And, and I want to help the whole industry be better, whether you're a sales or customer or not, you know, I think this is about sharing and, and, and caring and helping everyone be successful. So we've come up with six tips to help. This is for you as professionals, as leaders, whether you are a VP sales, whether you're a sales manager, whether you're an enabling professional, whether you're a salesperson yourself listening, here are six things that, that I've thought about this. We've thought about this over the last, you know, a couple of weeks when we were planning for this presentation for this session. Here are six things that I think we should be doing better. We got to strategize and I decided to make it all eyes, prioritize, personalize, humanize, systematize, and energize. These are six things that if we can get all of our sellers to be better at these, I think we're going to see lifts in productivity. I think we're going to see lifts in pipeline. I think we're going to see, you know, a much better prospecting outcomes uh, that our sellers and ultimately our buyers will have. And overall, the experience will be better for everyone. So let's let's go through some of these. And so first and foremost, strategize. You know, when we prospect, we need to have the right strategy. We need to know who we're prospecting to. And so the idea of an ideal customer profile, I think, is magical. You know, over the years, you know, my company, we haven't always had an ideal customer profile, but the moment we made that decision to have an ideal customer profile, specific demographics, specific psychographics, specific, you know, specific companies, specific industry, specific segments. And, and then, and then we're able to have clarity on the current situations, what's going on in their environments, what's going on, what are their trigger and what are their compelling events and what are their metrics and KPIs? It changes the game. And so, you know, really want to encourage each and every one of you to make sure that you've got your ideal customer profiles documented, you've got a strategy around them, and that you're enabling your teams to really understand this. And so these slides will be available. We'll make them available to everyone. And, uh, and, and hey, Frederick, as questions come in, please pause me and say, hey, let's, uh, there's a great question. Can you, can you take a, can you go a little deeper on a key point there? I'm seeing some, some, uh, some chat notes come in. So, um, we'll do. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So that's strategize, right? So this, this, if you just walk away with this one thing today and that thing is, Hey, let's, what is our ideal customer profile? Let's write it down. Uh, let's make sure that our SDRs, our AEs, let's make sure that everyone that is selling and prospecting understand it. And then let's provide them the tools and the resources so that way they can be really good at prospecting to these, to their specific personas. And so that's number one, strategize. Number two is prioritize. I think all too often, and I, I sellers hate when I say this, they got too many accounts. There's too many contacts. There's way, way, way too much. You know, I like the idea of picking 10 companies, 20 companies, 30 companies for a month and saying, these are the companies that I'm gonna go after this month. I am a big believer in territory plans. And uh, I think, so this is number two. If you don't, if you're not currently running a territory planning process with your sellers, I would highly encourage you to do it. And it means getting them to to, to, to self-identify goals. It means, you know, like having them communicate what those goals are, right? So for example, general rule of thumb, three to five X, right? So three to five X pipe to, uh, to quota. So if I got to close a million dollars, I got to have like a, like a $3 million in pipeline. Some of it will come from marketing. Some of it will be self-sourced, but, but having clarity on those numbers and getting folks to write them down and then to strive towards exceeding them is great. Good things happen when you plan and when you prioritize and also prioritizing activities. How many calls per week? How many emails per week? How many outreaches per week? How many handwritten notes per week? How many gifts are you going to send out per week? How many referrals are you going to do per week? Like these are activities that we should be doing, but we got to plan for them. So if we don't build them into our territory planning model, then we're not going to be able to get our teams to actually lean into it. And, and there is a correlation between more planning and more pipeline. And that's what that chart there shows. So in terms of like a territory planning template, you know, there's so many templates out there, but folks always love walking away with these templates. I love this. This is the five minute territory plan. 
you know, I, I've been through many territory planning programs over the years where it's 20, 30, 40 slides and crazy with a bunch of links to a bunch of systems like, hey, let's just get super focused. What's my quota? What's my monthly quota or quarterly quota, whatever? What's my year to date close? How much open pipeline do I have? How much pipeline do I have this quarter? How much more pipeline do I need? Simple math, but goodness will happen if you get everyone to kind of just write that math down. Like they'll be self aware, like, oh my God, I got to build more pipeline. Great. What are you going to do? Well, I got my deals I'm chasing this quarter, and now I got to focus on top 10 prospects. And it's not just picking names out of a hat. You got to be clear on the rationale and then you got to have a clear strategy for the outreach. See how much information is jam packed into this slide and imagine that you had your sellers and your sales teams filling this out once a month. And then, you know, go, you can even go a step further. We've got some of our customers, they'll actually record these and have the sales team record it. That way the reps can hear each other. That way managers can provide feedback and that way folks are accountable. That's what you want to do here. You want to really get folks to be accountable. You notice one of the things I highlighted was not motivated, right? We got to get people to lean into prospecting more and, and the strategizing and the prioritizing gives them the power that they need to, and the ownership and the, and, and the accountability to really kind of lift themselves up so they can do more. And that's, that's, the, uh, that's the second. The third pillar that I talked about is personalize. And in personalization, right? I, I did say there's a ton of automation out there and there's a balance, right? I had someone prospect to me and, and it was so clear that the email was generic and I and I, I sent her a note and I said thank you very much for the outreach but I'm going to give you some feedback you know first of all you know I'm not a technologist I'm a CEO second of all you know I think there's nothing in this email about me as an executive about me as a human being about me as a person about my company and you know I'd incur and I even wrote an email to her and I said hey, here's and, 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 you know, her is them in the, in, 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 in the general, I've done this a bunch of times. I'm just remembering one specific person and, and him or her, you know, and, and I, and I, and I, and I gave them kind of the email. I said, this would have been a better email. And, and, and that's how committed I am to helping teams be great. But these emails, they need to be, they need to be tailored. They need to be personalized. That subject line is so critical. It's not just for marketers. Right. That subject line needs to be short. I'm looking at it on the phone. It's got to be three to five words long. It's got to grab me. It's got to make me want to open the email and then read that first sentence. Just look at the pecking order of what's going on. Right. We need our teams to write compelling subject lines that are personalized to the role, mapping to trigger events, mapping to that to those ICP, to the ideal customer profile. And then you got to have a personalized intro. Like, let's just keep it real for a second. Right. It's it's you know, you can see hello, insert name. So it's got to be personalized. And, and on the left-hand side here, I'm writing context matters, right? I think if you're really writing a personalized email, hey, hope you're having a great Tuesday. Hope you're having a great Wednesday. You know, how's your week coming? Like there's things you can say in the email that shows people that it's not, it's not uh, a, a generic template email. Now there's a balance, right? There's a balance. And so uh, this is a debate, right? How much personalization versus time? But if you if you focus in on 10, 20, 30 accounts, there's no reason why you can't personalize a lot of emails and then do some of the automation for your B and C accounts. If you really want someone to open your email and you really want someone to reply and you want to have a real conversation with someone, you got to write a real email. I'm sorry, that's just the way it is. And, and we can debate that and I'd love to debate it. But uh, I think there's room for automation when you're trying to do mass outreach to a number of people. But if you got your top 10 accounts, uh, it's got to be personalized. And uh, Fred, any, 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 any contentious comments on that one from anyone? I'm curious. I saw the thing just light up a little bit. Um, the, um, no, no questions so far? Okay. So, uh, so great. So, so listen, you got to personalize the emails. They got to be persona based. And, uh, and then you've got to be able to, uh, to really provide the right context, time, season, role, news, current events. The company just went public and you're not mentioning that in the email, missed opportunity. They know that this is a template. And then you got to also look at connections. I love shared connections on LinkedIn. And so if it's true that I'm reaching out to someone, I'm going to mention if we have a shared connection. And I might even check to see how strong that connection is before I send that email. We're going to talk more about that in the cadences when we talk about uh, 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 systematizing your outreach. But here's just a simple anatomy of an email, compelling subject line, personalized intro, relevant question or statement, proof point or call to action. There are a lot of these templates. There's why you, why me? There's, there's a whole bunch of them out there, but I, I, I believe in simple. Here's another one from our friends at Winning by Design. It's the triple R, the three R's, 
relevance reward request, right? So there's a subject line, there's a clear opening, which is personalized. And then they talk about relevance and they talk about the reward, what's in it for the person. Why should they care? And then a request, what is the request? So whatever format you have, if you're an enabled professional or you're a VP sales or you're a salesperson, embrace a template that is uh, short, it's, it's not overly verbose with a ton of words. It's clear. It's personalized. It's almost like it's being handwritten for the person. Almost like. And, and so I'm going to just check the chat feed here. I'm just curious. Uh, uh, oh, yeah, hey, Chris. Chris how are you doing? Chris is asking, uh, how about sending content in one of the original uh, email outreaches? <laughs> Yeah, no, hey, Chris, by the way, great to hear from you. And, uh, and and thanks for the post yesterday. See, look at that, like people notice posts. And 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 so that's a touch in, in, in the prospecting world. But anyway, uh, to answer your question, I believe in always adding value, right? So the reward here is what's in it for them. Uh, when I do a multi-touch outreach, you know, I like to give them something, right? So for example, if we have a new person that just became or just got a job at a company. This is for us when we prospect right into our ICP. And it's an enablement person who is a new enablement person at the company. We'll send them a link that says, hey, listen, congratulations on your new role. Here's a blog that we wrote on first 90 days in enablement, right? There's a link, there's some content. We may even send them a book chapter. You know, here's a chapter on uh, go to market alignment, which is the foundation of building a strong program. Or we may say, send a link to, hey, here, here are a couple talks from some leaders that talk about what great sales enablement looks like. I'm a big believer in sending content that's relevant and personalized and targeted. And so hopefully that answers the question. Uh, all right, and uh, and so anyway, writing emails, uh, we could we could spend a day practicing, and 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 people do that, and and um, and and so um, the next piece here is about humanizing outreach, right? So it's not just about writing the right structure, but it's about the tone of the email, how those emails sound, how those voicemails sound, how those videos sound. Your outreach needs to be sincere. It needs to be authentic. It needs to be. You need to empathize, right? Listen, I know what it's like to get an email that isn't customized. I knew I know what it's like to get an email that's generic. I know what it's like when someone calls me on my phone and then they talk for 30 seconds without breathing and they're just pitching. And I literally have told people, slow down, like breathe. Like I literally have had someone once call me, hi, Eli, how you doing? I want to talk to you. And I said, hey, hey, stop. And folks here in the office hear me because they hear it. And I said, hey, you can you just take a breath for a second? Like, just breathe. Like, it's okay. I'm not going anywhere. You got me on the phone. Like, what's your name? Why are you calling? And how can I help you? And, and so uh, I think we got to be empathetic when we're prospecting. We got to remind our teams that they are, these are human beings on the other side of these phones and on the receiving end of these emails. And, and, uh, and so I'm, I'm just stressing that. And, uh, you know, we got to share stories, right? Stories work. You know, I think uh, uh, Chris and I have worked together, Brandy, and we worked together for many, many years, and he's a big believer in sharing stories. And and uh, and so uh, uh, I think sharing stories is, is something that's near and dear in my heart. So when you're prospecting and you're doing your outreach, right, try and resist pitch, but tell a story. You know, so when I get calls and, and when people pitch me, you know, they'll want to give me a pitch and I'll say, whoa, slow down. Can you just give me an example of a company like me that has had a, uh, you know, success using your system and, but, but make the company like me. So that, that way it's relatable. That means a lot, right? The amount of people that prospect and then they're referencing different size companies, different industries, it doesn't make sense. That needs to be trained. That needs to be skilled. That needs to be, you need to skill up your teams. You need to give them the tools and then, and then remind your people to pick up the phone, right? I don't know why folks are afraid to pick up the phone. They'll sit there, hide behind email, hide behind LinkedIn connections, hide behind this, hide behind, pick up the phone. Every email should be followed up with a, with a phone the same day. We're going to talk about that. And so, listen, I, 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 I believe so much about humanizing uh, our outreach. And, uh, you know, I love the work that John Selig is doing and uh, comedy writing for sales. John Selig is, is he's a speaker. He's a coach. Uh, he's a comedian and he's a good friend. We're both fellow Canadians and he lives in Montreal. And uh, why is John here? Right. John and I have worked together over the years and, you know, 
the idea of knowing your ideal customer profile, the idea of understanding your customer's triggers, the idea of understanding their business, their pains, their challenges, and then personalizing a note that, you know, kind of is, 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 you know, a professional joke. And he's going to talk more about it, but being able to know your customers better than them and to tell them something funny about their business that gets them, it's, it's an amazing differentiator. And, uh, you know, I think, uh, I think uh, I do want to invite John up. So I've asked John to come in and talk a little bit about how to craft punchlines that build pipelines. So he's going to spend five, 10 minutes and, and let's just see if he's, uh, let's just see how we make that happen. Hey, my dear friend, John Selig, let's talk about humanizing, humanizing outreach, humanizing communications, humanizing connections with comedy. So John, take it away. Thank you so much, Eli. You are a wonderful MC. You have a future in the comedy game if this whole sales enablement software thing does not work out. So thank you very much. Nice to be here, everybody. Everyone is here because they are struggling with prospecting. It's a challenge, uh, but I speak with a lot of CROs and they are also struggling with things like discounting, long cycles and slippage. And it saddens me because a sales executive's problems shouldn't sound like a midnight trip to Walmart. So I have no clue if anyone is laughing at that joke, but it doesn't matter. Eli, I got, got a late chuckle out of him. That's good. Uh, but that, that's just a short joke that I tell uh, a lot of CROs that I speak to and it gets their attention because in that first sentence, I nail three of their problems, three things that are they're struggling with and I'm making my very first few moments all about them. So um, look, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of SDRs in particular, anyone who prospects, uh, you know, they, they've never uh, had your buyer's job. They've never worked in their industry. And very often, unless you're in sales tech, they haven't used the stuff that you guys are selling. So there's a massive relatability gap. Um, and they often lack that, that real world um, experience and knowledge to have sometimes qualitative uh, conversations and consultative discussions with their buyers. And that can lead to a bit of a, a confidence um, gap sometimes. So that's a, that's a bit of a problem for anyone who's prospecting. Another one is that, like Eli mentioned, there's just so much outreach going on. There's just gazillions of emails. There's still a lot of cold calls going out there. There's tons of LinkedIn connection requests. And like Eli said, it's really hard to be both relevant and memorable not just period, but within a really short period of time because people's attention spans have like shrunk to like less than eight seconds. So those are two major problems, not really having that empathy and understanding of, of, of our buyer and their world and those, those short attention spans. So that joke I just told, um, I like to use the word joke. I remember when I spoke to Eli early on, he said, you should be saying humor. And I'm like, but, but in comedy, these are just jokes. And I realized he's right because people often think of a joke as like, uh, you know, three members from various interfaith groups walk into <laughs> an establishment of ill repute and say offensive things to one another. And I don't want my uh, sellers telling that to my buyers. No, a joke is just one or two sentences. The first sentence is, is very relevant and relatable to the listener. And, and the second part of the sentence or, or the joke uh, comes along and just subverts expectations and makes a powerful point that that's quite truthful. It could or may or may not involve yeah. puns. I don't teach puns at all. Thank you, by the way, for giving me my visual of a rabbi, a priest, and a monk for a moment. <laughs> you, know, you, you gave me that, and I appreciate that. Thank you. We need that. We need that, especially in a bar. That that's always the best place uh, yeah. for them to get together. Um, but but the jokes that I try and talk about and, and get my clients to to assemble and use in their prospecting efforts are ones that roast your prospect's pain. So I don't know if any of you guys have ever watched like a roast battle or a, a Comedy Central roast of a celebrity, but those are jokes that involve deep cutting truths um, ab about the subject at hand. Instead of writing a joke about a person, you're just writing a joke about a problem which sucks for your buyer, which it just so happens you have a solution to. So the idea is that these kind of jokes can paint that memorable powerful picture uh, that's rooted in truth, that triggers an emotional reaction out of your buyers and, and helps a rep to stand out. And what's more human than, than, than a moment of laughter and connecting on a level right. that is, uh, that, that's real. And that, while it's not personal, like, hey, Eli, I, I know you like 70s rock and, and 90s funk, um, but it, it's because I looked at your LinkedIn profile, 
but I know I'm showing I know something about your job and your challenges, and I'm presenting them to you in a way that gets your attention and just like I said, elicits that emotional reaction to form that human connection with your buyer. So before I talk about jokes, though, um, jokes are hard to come up with. And I think a lot of people think that the, the, the whole idea of being funny is that you can just say something spontaneous off the top of your head in the moment. That is not at all what I teach. I don't teach improv. I teach the craft of writing humor for very particular micro audiences, a.k.a. your buyers, your prospects, your ICP. And let's talk about just what goes into the process to assemble a short little joke that roasts your buyer's pain. I have some examples on the next slide. But the first thing is like Eli talked about, we have to have insight into who is our buyer, what is their desired end state, um, what are the roadblocks in the way and how do those roadblocks affect their emotions? What do they fear? What do they hate? What just frustrates them? And of course, what do they love? What do they want and what do they need? And then which of those problems, those roadblocks, can you remove for them to help them get to their desired end state uh, do you understand what industry they're working in and what some of the common threats and challenges in that world are? Uh, do you understand their level of authority? Um, and so once we paint out who our audience is, uh, I, like for example, you guys, I, I would assume are mainly sales enablement pros. Yeah. And we have some sales leaders. Uh, that joke I told up top was meant to demonstrate my relevance to you up top and, and talk about those problems. Um, but I know that in tech world, especially tech sales world, we love our buzzwords. Marketing people, uh, if you're on the call, God bless you. You guys have put together a lot of buzzwords that most of us never use in our day-to-day -day language. I've never used the words maximize in a non-business setting uh, or optimize. Um, and, and at the same time, uh, there's a lot of vocabulary and common human phrasing that we're leaving on the table that can paint far more graphic pictures and help us just stand out. So the process of writing this kind of humor forces everyone to paraphrase everything, develop new phrasing and vocabulary, even leaning on some common cliches. And then sort of that assembly of the joke um, and, and figuring out what, what's a problem to this buyer helps build that, that empathy and it helps us even learn just about the buyer's world and, and, and what they're trying to achieve. And if we can write a great joke, it's, it's meant to be empathetic, relatable yeah. and memorable all within a short 15 second span. Boom. I can't wait to see some of these. All right. Well, something I like to talk about, and I'm ready for it. I got, I got you covered, Eli. Yeah. Um, something I, I, something that I, I like, as I sold like uh, technology for about a dozen years, and I've been a stand-up for about ten. Uh, I made this weird career transition because, for whatever reason, I realized I don't like money. I want to do new things in life. And so, comedy, though, I realized like the first time I got on stage, there's a ton of parallels between cold between comedy cold calling and making even boardroom presentations to decision making teams so i kind of designed this little this little icon here to show to kind of de demonstrate the parallels between sales and comedy i'm going to show you guys three examples of what i'm talking about they have come out of my workshops bear in mind these jokes weren't written for you by no means should you find these hilarious but i'm hoping you see a pattern in them so the first one is that, and this is for COOs and vice presidents of IT who don't want to deal with print. They don't want to deal with anything to do with print. So the joke that these guys- yeah. are, I actually just laughed at that one. It's kind of there funny. There you go. It's a great, it's actually, <laughs> it's a great joke. And, and I, didn't, I, I didn't mean to cut you off. I like it. <laughs> and I remember like, like, look, joke writing is a funnel approach. Most are going to stink, but eventually you find a couple of concepts that are precious to you. You work on them. And they close, they, they're funny. And I remember going up to the whiteboard, this is right before the pandemic in, in, on Long Island with Canon. And this one guy said, had this exact joke. And I'm like, that's a magic joke. Yeah. That room full of toner could be good inventory management or a sign of a hoarding disorder. <laughs> like, come on, everybody's gotta be laughing. Give us a little bit of sign here. <laughs> Tell us you're laughing, show us, give us some, give us some signs. That's awesome, keep going. Yeah, Bill, Bill Bliss raises his hand. You got, you got, we're getting, there, there's laughter here. Laughing, Lolo, you got, keep going, John. This is yeah, awesome. Don't, yeah, I'm not dying inside like I normally do when I hear no laughter. That's great. Yeah. Um, also, I worked with the guy, these guys, Interplay Learning, and they offer virtual simulation technology, training technology to HVAC technicians. Uh, and it's hard to get them to, to learn new things and to scale the training. 
So these guys wrote, you guys can read it now. The joke is ruined. The only thing harder to scale than one-on-one maintenance training is that mountain of bills from your third-party vendor. Right. Because they got to outsource it. It's expensive. It's unpredictable. And this is all stuff that came out of kind of the, the journey to the jokes. And then they just assembled it. And the last one, because I like telling the jokes, is I worked with a company called EventMobi. And uh, they do apps for conferences so that people, so that conference planners don't have to spend copious amounts of time and money printing off agendas, which just get thrown out when the conference is over. So the joke that they wrote is the most challenging part of printing programs for conferences is finding a big enough recycling bin to put them in. But I'm bummed. I love it. There you go. So, so there's, you know, I could put you on the spot, but I won't do that. But these three jokes have one, th they have two things in common. They all present the problem and an impact of not solving the problem. What they're gonna have to deal with if they choose to ignore this problem. And that, that's, you know, understanding what could happen if they don't solve the problem to me is sales training 101. So even if they don't write great jokes, uh, they're at least learning a little bit more from a subject matter perspective. Totally. Like, come on, like, like, listen, if I was to get an email, and which, listen, some of the emails I get that are great are personalized, they picked up something about me. And I've, I've had a couple, you know, attempts at jokes come my way. I will, I will always respond to them and appreciate them for that, right? And so this is that extra step. You want to differentiate, you want to get people, and I love it, right? Getting our people to, to, to really learn more. So now you have a process for it. So I'm going to let you take over. Sorry for jumping in. I'm, I'm, really, I'm really happy you came on today because it's so pertinent to this conversation. No, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you're digging in. I'm glad, uh, I'm glad you invited me. That's, that's, uh, that's also goes both ways. So, you know, think about it guys. Um, if you ever go see comedians on an, on an amateur night and open mic, you're going to see a lot of crap. And uh, I like to talk about what can salespeople learn from truly terrible stand comedians, but you'll also see some good ones and you don't know who they are, but they all have one thing in common they're making you laugh within the first 12 to 15 seconds of them coming on stage. And it's usually scripted, crafted jokes uh, that they use repeatedly, same as a cold call script. So when someone answers the call, you ultimately have like six to eight seconds to demonstrate your relevance. And you should really get to that, to a reaction within another six or seven, let's say. So I work with a lot of SDRs and I, when the pandemic hit and my pipeline uh, disappeared because there were no on-site events and I didn't have a virtual offer, um, I was doing some, some open registration classes. Right. And, and I had eight SDRs on a call. And I said on the first call, I'm like on the first class, tell me your name, your company, what you do and your, your opening line when you make a cold call. And seven out of eight of them said, hey, this is X with Y, and can I have 27 seconds of your time to tell you why I called? Right. Seven out of eight from eight different companies had the exact, exact same formula. Rinse and repeat. And, and I see the other one that I see going around on LinkedIn. Uh, this is a cold call. So uh, if, uh, if you'd like to hang up, now's the time. A little funnier. But if everyone's doing it, then how special is it, right? Right. Um, so, you know, I'm going to talk about why this works. I call this humor's value chain. Like if you guys get it and like it, great. But let, let's unpack the various reasons as to why this makes sense. Right. So there's relevance, whether it's in that room full of toner, could be good inventory management, whether it's uh, scaling one-on-one -on -one maintenance training or printing off programs, there's a relevance. And that, that leads to credibility like really quickly. And then of course, if it's a problem for them, it might not be a problem for them, but at least you're relevant. But if it is a problem, you've triggered them. And all of a sudden they're just like, geez, we're, we're struggling with that right now. And of course, if they laugh at the joke, right. uh, you, you know, there, there's, you have their attention. And that's the hardest thing in, in prospecting is getting people's attention, being relevant, and of course, credibility. And once we're credible and, and once we're relevant, uh, and, and we've made them laugh. They like us. Uh, at that point, they trust us. And as sellers, I, I believe that's personally key, pretty key. I couldn't find a good um, emoticon or, or symbol for humanization. So we just chose a baby. But that's where the humanity 
really happens is in these human connections. Yeah. Um, it boosts, if I make Eli laugh, it boosts my confidence. Uh, and it just makes for easier conversations. And there is no symbol for pipeline. So I just chose an oil well. Uh, right. I, 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 we get, we get it. <laughs> I, uh, John, this is great, right? And so we wanted to give folks just a, a slightly different twist on humanizing, personalizing, and turning those outbound messages, whether they are email or voicemail uh, or pitch or video broadcast, whatever you're doing, just a little bit more human and, and to make it a little bit more fun and make it a little more fun for everyone, for your SDRs and AEs doing the outreach and also for those on the receiving end, because ultimately we want you to to, have to differentiate, right? And we want you to be able to, because like these jokes, right? Maybe it's in an email, but guess what? When I'm leaving you a voicemail, I'm like, hey, did you get my joke? Right, that's, it's, um, what? Who's this guy, joke? I'm gonna go figure out what that joke was in the email, right? And, and so there's a lot of goodness here, John. No, I appreciate that. One other thing though, you can take each of these jokes and this is something I, I, I do in my workshops is uh, create little playbooks using the jokes where we adapt each of the jokes for various outreach channels. So uh, yep. I'll help you guys adapt it for a cold call script, uh, how to open a cold email, including a subject line, a LinkedIn connection request, and to be honest, like I built my business on one joke. This is John Seelig, uh, and this call is like a craft beer because it's unique, refreshing, and ice cold. And <laughs> people, it's, it's literally built my business, but I've used that across all the outreach channels, uh, voicemail as well. And very often, even if you send it, it doesn't mean they read it, you could still reuse the joke. And the, jo the, the, the real goal is to get these jokes, not everyone's gonna take to them, not everyone's gonna feel comfortable delivering them, but the process is valuable. And even if like a fraction of your team latches onto one joke, that they could hammer on micro audience after micro audience to, to relate and, and connect right. with them. Um, that's a way. Let's, let's, so keep your slides going. Let's just keep going because, because we are, I, I, I don't want to start and stop. So uh, if you don't mind just staying yeah. right here. And then, and then uh, I think uh, one thing I, I do want to highlight um, you know, we've got a partnership with John Selig and, 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 and we are bringing his amazing content and his amazing workshops into the hood, into our library. I'm going to talk to you in a little bit about how to scale uh, uh, prospecting and pipeline building. I'm going to show you a system and just understand that we want to give folks a little taste. We're curious for feedback, right? So how interesting would it be if you had a course or a huddle in saleshood where you could deliver training to your teams so that way they can practice leaving voice messages and writing emails and, and do it with a little bit of comedy and humor around it. That's a question. And, and, and this was the purpose of this was to start looking at new creative ways to do outreach. And, and I think, uh, and so John, okay, I'm going to move forward. Yep. Thank you. And thank you again. And, and, and stay with me, right? I think there might be some additional comments. I think in, 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 in our six pillars, right, we want to systematize outreach, right? So I'm not suggesting that these eight are the only eight. I'm suggesting that there's a, a, a wide diverse ways to do outreach. Personalized emails, phone and voice messages, LinkedIn connections, referral emails, right? Likes and comments on, on Twitter, on LinkedIn, on other social platforms, video messages, uh, even sending an appropriate gift, right? To someone, a handwritten thank you card and sharing content. I know there was a question earlier, right? And so, uh, there are a lot of companies like SalesLoft and Outreach that will do the automation. And by the way, we're just working on our SalesLoft integration now, which I'm so excited about. And we can go to the next slide just to kind of give you a flavor for, uh, for, for and, and, and so now here are some rules that we want to give you some tips, you know, and, and based from our friends at SalesLoft where we're looking at 200 million interaction, right? So now I want you to think about those are eight types of, 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 of activities, outreach activities. Now we want you to do at least eight to 10. That should be the baseline. You could do 12 even, uh, but the more touches, the greater likelihood you're gonna build trust, build rapport, build relationship and remain front and center. Because just because someone isn't buying today doesn't mean they're gonna to buy tomorrow. And if your outreach is professional and differentiated and, 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 and it doesn't necessarily need to be all in, in two weeks, it could be over 30 days. You can see the fourth point there, cadence length varies. There, isn't, there aren't any set rules that say you gotta finish your cadence in two weeks. You know, you gotta, you gotta, maybe you've got like this burst of cadence at the beginning, and then you realize now's not the time. And then you put them on a slow drift over two to three months afterwards. Proven. When you send an email, you gotta do a call same day. You look at the data, the data proves you get much, much higher 
results and better outcomes and better callbacks and better conversions. And you should also start your cadence with an email and a call, right? Those are two things that are hard pressed truths from the 200 million transactions that uh, interactions that sales left did. And then listen, another thing that's so important when you're looking to systematize, you got to share best practices, right? So we can go to the next slide. And, and, uh, and I think, you know, one of the things that I've, I've really liked that has come out over the last 12 to 18, over the last 12 months, post, post pandemic, post COVID is this reliance on video to share information, uh, to share information asynchronously, to shorten sales cycles, to get information to people ahead of calls, to get information to people's gratitude after calls. And I love what LinkedIn just released. And some of you may know this, some of you may not know it, but LinkedIn released video prospecting and messaging in the system. So if you have a first degree connection with someone, you can literally pick up your phone, hit record and, I, and send them a video message and uh, hey, John, great to connect with you. Uh, looking forward to collaborating and learning from you. Hey, John, really been loving your content. We'd love to grab five minutes of your time so we can kind of compare notes. Or hey, John, we had a great meeting and, uh, and, and really thankful that you set up the meeting and we're able to bring your team to the table. Just want to say thank you, right? Those are quick, short, professional video messages that you can now press a button from LinkedIn and you can send it. And, and with Saleshood, we're also uh, working on rolling this into our platform as well. So we're going to have video sharing too. So what does great sales enablement look like? So we have an end-to-end -end program for enabling professionals so they can scale. We want you to scale getting your teams, building pipeline and focusing in on prospecting. And so we have a program that will start with you know, publishing the, the publishing the path, getting your teams to 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 learn the best in terms of what good prospecting looks like, what do those email templates look like, how to do multi-touch outreach, how to practice their pitch. And so what does great sales and what looks like? It looks like publishing the right content, teaching your teams, getting them to practice, assessing, applying, teaching managers need to coach, and then they need to be able to also use that content just in time. That's why we're integrating with sales law. And most importantly, you got to correlate so that way you know the true causation of what's happening in the business. And, uh, and this is Saleshood. For those of you that know Saleshood, amazing. For those of you that are new to Saleshood, you know, we're purpose-built all-in-one sales enabled platform, micro-learning, micro-coaching uh, with collaborative, uh, 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 collaborative content sharing, selling. And then we're what we're doing is we're analyzing that data, correlating it, and providing amazing answer to the questions of, hey, how am I enabling my teams and is it working? So, so here, here's the prospecting. Uh, bootcamp path and you can see the micro learning and the micro coaching and here's an example right remote selling readiness right so what we want to do is we want to get your team to be better at the basics right technical setups dress code when and how to use virtual backgrounds stage in their backgrounds you know so these are some of the technical setups when we are doing prospecting right so it makes sense you want them to show up be professional and then and then you can see here every one of these topics are organized in the same way, right? We want them to learn their elevator pitch. We want them to be better at telling stories. We want them to update their LinkedIn profile. We want to do territory planning. Remember I showed you that territory planning template? Guess what? Here's a coaching video for territory planning. Here's some manager tips. Here's where they're going to prioritize the accounts and here's where they're going to upload their path, right? So I can go here, I can look at the coaching video. So what we're offering you here is with Saleshood, yeah, we've got a platform and it's amazing and it's purpose built all in one but we're also giving you the content. So that way uh, you can see, uh, you know, coaching videos with the templates, with the exercises, with the collaboration so your teams can prioritize together, strategize together, learn from each other. So critical, so critical. And I'm gonna go back to the path and just give you another little, another little taster of what's in here. The, the other one that I love to show is, um, well, I'm gonna show you one more. So, so there's the territory planning, account planning, prospecting. So you can see here, just taking a step back, how cool would it be if you took your team and, and you had them run through this over two weeks? And at the end of two weeks, their pitch was better. They had stories that were better. Their LinkedIn profile was polished and cleaned up. They had a territory plan that was prioritized. They were practicing and learning from each other on what the multi-step outreach should, could be. They were sharing best practices and they're even writing emails. And then later on, we'll add in the, the comedy writing here too. And then here is that LinkedIn video prospecting one, which is like, okay, great. Now let's have our teams actually write out their pitches that they're gonna leave on, on video and then pitch practice as well, where they can, guess what? They can practice, record, score, feedback. This is purpose-built. This entire path is purpose-built for our teams. And this is just showing you how the system works, how you're able to just very quickly 
uh, do the recordings in the system, right? So the system is purpose built to help you and your teams up level their prospecting and pipeline building activities. And our, our, our aim here was to give you a flavor of what the system looks like. I did highlight a lot of best practices. So we will send a follow-up email, which will have a number of these resources that are available on our blogs, LinkedIn video prospect, five minute territory plan, email best practices, cold calling checklist. But listen, ultimately, here's, here's what we hope you walked away with. We hope you walk away with uh, ways to get your teams to be more productive and to be better at pro prospecting and pipeline building. We hope that you got some new ideas that you can take back to your teams. And, uh, and, you know, got introduced to how to in, in, inject comedy. And, uh, and we hope that you are now thinking more strategically about how you can enable your teams with your managers and at scale. And, and if anyone is interested in diving into the platform to use it to actually realize some pipeline creation results, we'd be more than happy to be here and support you. And, uh, and that's it. I do want to say formally thank you for listening. And uh, as always, my team and I are here to support you. So thank you.